In the 2020-21 season, shortly after OKC moved on from the Westbrook and Paul George era, the team won just 22 games. They were the second worst team in the Western Conference. And it was expected. They were starting a brand new rebuild, after all. But fast forward a couple years later, and now they've been at the top or near the top of the conference. One of the NBA's most elite teams. Not just that, but from now until the year 2030, they have a whopping 15 first round picks and 22 second round picks. Not all of them will convey, because some of them are protected, but even then, 9 first round picks are guaranteed to be theirs. That's astounding. They're contending for the championship, but also have a massive amount of assets to set themselves up for the future, or the potential to package those picks for another star. To top it off, they're currently the youngest team in the league, with an average age of 23.1 years old. The Oklahoma City Thunder literally have everything you could ask for. But just how do they get into this ridiculously awesome situation? How do they construct a roster that's able to compete among the very best, but are simultaneously the youngest team in the league with a boatload of assets? They're in the best position out of any team in the NBA. How's it going folks, my name's Andy, and today let's talk about the greatest rebuilding story the NBA has ever seen. Something that a lot of young rebuilding teams struggle with is they got a lot of young players who are all trying to be the main guy. It makes sense, I mean a lot of young teams have players who are once highly touted prospects, so they expect to become a star. They expect to get the ball all the time, because they want to be the franchise player. But when you have too many of these guys, it may lead to a power struggle within the team. When you have a bunch of young guys fighting for touches, trying to get their own shots, that will lead to problems down the road. For the Oklahoma City Thunder, however, there is a clearly defined best player on this team, and he's been their best player for years now, Shea Gilgis Alexander. On a team full of young players, he's the leader, and no one's gonna question him getting the final shot or shooting the ball too much, because everyone on the team, everyone in the world, knows he's far better than any other player on this roster. There is a clearly defined hierarchy of players, and he's at the very top. Compared to many other rebuilding teams where you're kind of unsure, and you have young guys fighting for that top spot, that's not the case with this team. However, like most other young teams, they do have a plethora of guys who are, you know, the second, third, and fourth options. But when they're asked to take a step back and let the main guy of this franchise handle it, they will. No questions asked. With that being said, let's go back a bit and see how this began. While the Thunder did get a decent haul in return for Westbrook, we've yet to see the full impact of these picks that they have in their arsenal. It was actually the Paul George trade to the Clippers that created the foundation in which this new era is built upon. In this particular trade, the Thunder not only received Shea in return, but also the ever so important Clippers 2022 unprotected first round pick. They eventually used this pick to draft Jalen Williams. Jalen Williams ultimately became a central piece of this franchise. That's two core pieces of their team received in one trade, in addition to all the other picks and future assets that are yet to be seen. At the time this happened, this wasn't necessarily a bad trade for the Clippers. Kawhi had already joined the Clippers and wanted them to make a push for Paul George, so that they can have the chance to contend right away. Shea in his rookie year with the Clippers showed promise. Just like in his lone season at Kentucky, you could tell he had a unique skill set for a point guard. Nobody else played like him. So there were questions of if his playstyle could actually work in the modern NBA. A point guard who's bigger in terms of height. Not exactly a three-point shooter, nor a natural passer. In a way, he scores almost like a small forward. The Clippers were unsure if he could elevate his playstyle to an all-star caliber level. And with a new goal of competing right away, they did not have time to wait. I don't fault the Clippers for trading him away. Even at the time, he wasn't seen as the main guy in this deal. It was all those picks that attracted OKC in doing this trade. In fact, Sam Presti did not even want to make this trade to begin with. They never wanted to get rid of George. 
the I know that he had he had he had used the term mutual. I don't. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that because that would infer that we we were wanting to to trade Paul George, which I think most people would agree that that probably wasn't on, on the top of our off season priority list. The players have the freedom to be able to to talk and recruit, and there's nothing limiting that, and that um, it changed the game for us. Paul George requested a trade, and in situations like this, usually the player has a lot of leverage in where he goes. But Presti still managed to get a massive haul for him. Even if Shea didn't work out, they'd still be in a great spot due to everything else they got back. It just shows how important having a great GM is, especially one who's backed by the full support of the organization. This leads to our next topic. The MVP over there is Sam Preston. He the MVP. This guy's eye for talent. He drafted KD, Russ, Jeff Green, Serge Ibaka, Reggie Jackson, and the list goes on and on and on. Did you know that Sam Presti is the longest tenure GM in the NBA? With Greg Popovich transitioning to become the Spurs president, Presti now holds the record for the current longest tenure GM at 17 plus years. He's been in the business since 2007 and he blows all of his peers out of the water. Right now, no other team has a GM that comes close to his longevity. After the unfortunate relocation of the Seattle Supersonics, it was a depressing way for a city to lose their team. As one city wept in sadness, it was the start of a new era. An era in Oklahoma City that immediately saw success. Right from the get-go, Presti and the organization established a winning culture. Every single player they drafted in the lottery in this two-year span turned out to be MVP-level players. Franchise-changing guys who turned out to be this generation's greatest superstars. To have these guys lead your franchise in a brand new city, it was surreal. You could say OKC fans are spoiled. The chance to experience such legendary superstars right when the team moved here, that's an opportunity that some teams have never experienced in their entire team's history. Because of this, the team and the city have the expectations to win. When you think of the Thunder, you think of winning. Every player that arrives to this team has that expectation to help this team win, because they've gotten used to OKC being a successful team. You know, teams draft superstars all the time, but what separates a good rebuild from a bad one is how the team surrounds their main stars. Over time, Presti has drafted great supporting players in Serge Ibaka, Steven Adams, Reggie Jackson, along with trades to bring in guys who can shore their weaknesses and fill in the gaps. Perhaps not all of his trades were perfect, and some would say OKC missed out on a championship or two had they kept this big three together. Even so, they still competed for such a long time. This marked a significant era in Thunder history, and this mentality has carried over to the next generation of players. Prior to OKC making a massive jump, if we go back to the previous year, 2022-23, this is when things started to turn around, although it was a slow process. So what exactly happened? If you recall, the Thunder were supposed to be tanking. Do you remember towards the end of that season? The Thunder were within reach of the playoffs, but coincidentally, Shea mysteriously entered the health and safety protocols, and he did not play in several games during their push to the playoffs. The rumors were the Thunder sat him out on purpose to hopefully lose the next few games to get a higher lottery pick. In hindsight, it kind of makes sense. We found out that they were reaching for Case and Wallace, a highly touted prospect, and he wanted to be drafted by OKC as well. It was a match made in heaven, and the Thunder were close to getting a top 10 pick that year. But by making the play-in tournaments at the end of the season, they were just slightly out of reach to draft Case and Wallace. Eventually, they got him anyway, by trading up with the Mavs. And basically, preseason predictions had the Thunder winning just 24 games, yet they shattered those predictions by winning 40. Of course, the biggest outlier was Shea's development. Not even the most sophisticated projection models had him reaching this level this quickly. He went from being a fringe all-star candidate to a legitimate superstar in the span of a single offseason. What stands out most about Shea is his consistency. It seems like he rarely, if ever, has a bad game. 
For a guy of his age to play with this much poise, that's super impressive. He's a special player. What also surprised a lot of folks was how seamlessly Jalen Williams fit into this team. That season, it was his rookie year, and his maturity, his steady, consistent playstyle fit well within the theme of this young team. Josh Giddy also made a noticeable leap and became the playmaker they needed. It wasn't just Shea's insane development, the entire team became better together and played well with each other. Um, he has a, a core belief system, and I 100% I agree with it. Him instilling those things in us when we were a 15 wins team to when we were a 22 win team till now, it's made it easier for us to grow. You know, out of timeouts, out of you know, you know, when we run our first play of the game or whatever it is, um, he's always drawing something up that's good, that, that's really good and, and effective, and he, he understands how to get guys going. Um, I think for a coach to have a certain relationship with every player is rare. It's hard to coach a, like a young team, and I think he's done a really good job of that, and he's been able to relate to us. So, Mark Dagnalt joined this team as the head coach back in 2020. At the time, he was a relatively unknown guy. Plus, it was during the pandemic, so not many folks were paying attention to basketball at all. It wasn't until recently that Mark Dagnalt has been getting more and more recognition for being one of the NBA's brightest young coaches. For those who don't know, he's been with the organization for a long time actually, and even coached OKC's G League team for five years before coming up to the Thunder. Like how every team has young project players that they develop over time, Mark Dagnalt was kind of a project coach. For years, Presti recognized his intuition for the game, but more importantly, his ability to relate and empathize with every player on his team. You heard it from the players themselves, they have an immense amount of praise for him. Sam Presti once said, as we reposition our franchise for future sustainable success, we want to remain cutting edge and forward thinking. I can't think of someone better than Mark. This year has been a revelation. With Chet Holmgren suiting up for the first time, we thought he would take a while to get accustomed to the NBA game. It didn't take him very long. Now every player on this team made another jump this year, even if it's not reflected in their numbers. Lou Dort, for example, he was scoring a lot more when the Thunder were bad. But now that he's taking less shots and being more picky with his shots, he's more efficient than he's ever been. Also credit to this team's much better spacing. Jalen Williams has gotten more of the playmaking duties now, expanding on his ever so successful rookie campaign. As the NBA moves towards flexibility and versatility, the Thunder are at the forefront of this revolution. All of their guys can shoot, dribble, pass, finish. They can play multiple positions, they can guard multiple positions. This creates a dynamic offense where there's very little stagnation and a lot of efficient shots are taken. When you have five players who are threats to score from every single spot on the floor, they're bound to have a great offense. It also resulted in OKC taking the second most wide open shots per game, right behind the Indiana Pacers. The only time the offense slows down is when Shea has the ball and tries to go one on one. That's a good thing, though, because you want Shea to do that. He's such an efficient, lethal scorer. Out of all players who average at least 25 points a game, he is number one in true shooting percentage, at over 65%. Plus, with OKC playing at a very fast pace, you need your superstar to be able to slow the game down, control the pace of the game, and maybe draw some fouls here and there. If you watch him play, you wouldn't think he's still so young. He plays like a seasoned veteran, very methodical and cerebral. The perfect leader for this young team. Over the years, as the Thunder realized Shea would become the franchise superstar, they acquired players who could fit alongside him. I mentioned how OKC takes the second most wide open shots per game. That's because their spacing is incredible. Surrounded by high quality shooters, that helps Shea's game tremendously. It gives him so much space to play his own game, in particular, his isolation plays. Shea is fifth in the NBA in terms of frequency of running isolations, with over one-fifth of his possessions. And he's scoring 1.22 points per possession from them, higher than any of the top five ISO players. Plus, it seems like almost every player on this team is a decent shooter. Speaking of which, there were questions of, can Chet actually produce in his rookie year? 
Isn't he too skinny? Won't he get abused by other centers due to his lanky frame? Well, he has crushed all the doubts. He's holding opponents to 58% shooting within 5 feet of the basket. For comparison, that's the same percentage as Rudy Gobert. It's safe to say he has excelled beyond our expectations on defense. Offensively, he fits so well. You combine the team's spacing plus Shea's gravity, Chet has room to flourish. Overall, if you're a brand new NBA fan and you don't know which team to follow, the Thunder might be your team. They're just so fun to watch and they're so young and energetic. With a coach that's unorthodox and likes to adapt and try new things, they're changing the game with this new wave of NBA talent. It's a great time to be a fan of the Thunder, and it just shows how much it matters to have a competent front office and coach. Thank you all so much for watching, let me know your thoughts on where do you see this Thunder team going in the next few seasons? Do you see them making a run to the title? I feel like they have the pieces to do so, it just takes some more experience and development and I think they'll be right there. Anyway, I hope y'all enjoyed the video, and of course, as always, I'll see you next time. Peace.